Hello, I'm Herb Dickerson, and I'm bringing this message on behalf of the Cross Branded Cowboy Church in Pineville, Louisiana, at the request of the elders of that church. It's my privilege to be able to be your preacher for this worship service. No one can doubt that our country, indeed our whole world, is undergoing a time of monumental stress during these days. We're seven weeks now, or eight weeks, into the coronavirus shutdown. This thing is turning into a national disaster that has never been seen before in my lifetime. Lives are being lost by the tens of thousands, and livelihoods are being lost by a staggering proportion of our neighbors in our country. It will take years for the historians to assess the damage of these days and tell the story that we're living through. The distress of this episode in our country's history came home to me and Vicki in a very personal way during the last few days. One of our favorite friends died from the coronavirus. He and I had been work buddies and we had been fellow laborers in church ministry in our area in central Louisiana. We, our, our, our uh, sympathy and our prayers go out to his wife and his two sons who now have the uh, sad, sad chore, task, assignment of learning to live with a new normal with their loved one being gone. What does a Christ follower have to say in moments like this? The Bible tells us we're supposed to be able, if we're believers and followers of Christ, to give reason for the hope that is within us. How can we give any reason or purpose or meaning to what we're all going through during these days? I'm going to invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 3 through 12. And the purpose of this is to try to get into the spirit of what Peter was doing when he wrote this epistle many years ago, over against a time very similar to ours. The purpose of First Peter was to lift God's people above the anxiety, the fear, and the stress of a terrible, terrible time in their history. As a matter of fact, Peter himself, who wrote this epistle in about the year 63, 62, 63, would be dead before this episode of human history would run its course, the Neronian persecution. Our distress today is physical. His, in that day and time, was political, but people were dying needlessly, and people were dying in an untimely fashion just the same. Read with me. As Peter lifts us and, and shows us how the person of Christ lives above the fray and the, act, the anxiety of our day and time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord begotten us again to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, unfading, resolved, reserved in heaven for you. You who are being kept by the power of God through faith for a salvation that's already prepared and ready to be revealed at the last time. Now, in this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, even gold tried by fire, your faith might be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, not having seen, you love, and though you do not see him yet, you believe, and in your loving and believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now concerning this salvation, the prophets in the Old Testament inquired, and they searched diligently, and they 
they were prophesying the grace that would come to you, but they were searching what time or what kind of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have been who have been our preachers of the gospel, preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, giving us things into which even the angels desire to look. First Peter chapter one verses three through twelve. I want to direct your attention quickly, quickly to verse six. There's something here that I think we just absolutely have to have if we're going to begin to get into this passage of Scripture. Notice verse 6 when it says, In this you greatly rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved with various trials. Peter was talking about the political trial they were going through. It was a grievous time. It was a terrible time. It was a horrible time. It was a time where people would uh, lose their livelihoods. They would lose their franchise in the society of which they were a part. And some of them would lose their very lives themselves, among whom were Peter and the Apostle Paul. But notice the little phrase that Peter used. He says, for a little time, if necessary, indicating that times of trial... Times of hardship and distress are not always necessary, and they don't last forever. A little while, a short time, a temporary period is what he's talking about here. And he points out that as the supreme sovereign ruler of the universe, Almighty God, in his uh, operation of the universe, sees to it that times of great distress Don't go on and on forever. This too shall pass. Notice the little phrase, if necessary. Sometimes distressed seasons are necessary in God's eyes. He's the one who permits them. He's the one who is the ruler of human history. You've seen in the Bible many times before where the Lord has found it necessary to bring about or to permit times of distress in the lives of his people. You remember the days of Elijah. There was a famine. It lasted three years. It didn't rain. People were starving. Elijah went to visit a a little lady and her son, and she was preparing to cook the last bit of food that they have, and then they would starve to death. Elijah asked that he might be allowed to sit down and share the meal with them. The lady told him what the problem was, And uh, he still wanted to eat with them, and she fed him. And the food didn't wear out. The oil in the jar and the cornmeal and the wheat flour did not run out of her jar throughout the rest of the time of the famine. But it was a time that God found necessary to get the attention of his people and the king of his nation, his country, Israel. Same thing happened in the Babylonian captivity. God found it necessary to get their attention. And a time of horrible, horrible distress came upon the people of God. You read about it in the book of Lamentation. And you read about it in the the prophecies of Jeremiah. If necessary. Sometimes God deems it necessary. And he doesn't cause coronavirus. But he does most certainly permit it. He could stop it if he wanted to. He could kill the little bugs immediately with just one word. But because of his permissive will, these bugs go on and they do their damage because God in his grace and wisdom finds it necessary to permit such a thing to take place. Now, I want to point out a second verse in this passage of Scripture. Sometimes it's necessary for times of distress. But if you go to verse 7, you'll find this. All the time, not sometimes, but all the time, distresses are beneficial 
in the lives of God's people, or at least they can be. Listen to verse 7 very carefully. This happens so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though tested with fire, that your faith might be found after the testing unto praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Times of distress, sometimes necessary, but all the time they can be beneficial. It works on Christian faith, times of distress, just like fire in a kiln works on gold ore. The fire gets so hot that it melts away metals that are somehow, some way or other attached to the gold. And when you wind up melting all of that stuff away, you come out with refined gold, which is much, much more valuable. Let me tell you something right now. Refined faith is much more valuable than just common, everyday, ordinary, untested faith. Always beneficial. Always beneficial in the lives of God's people these times of distress. James, half-brother of Jesus, puts it this way when he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into various temptations and trials, knowing that the testing and the trying of your faith will make it grow and it will become richer and more valuable and it will become a more dynamic, life-changing force in your personality. Sometimes necessary, all the time beneficial for God's people. I want you to just look now at about three benefits that come out of times of testing as Peter lays them out here for us. The first of the great uh, benefits, I don't even know what kind of a phrase to give this. I can point it out to you, though. You can see it in verse 10. Of us salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, the ones who were prophesying the grace that would come to you, and they were searching what time or what kind of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. The sufferings of Christ and the sufferings of Christ's people and the glories to follow. The prophets didn't understand it. Look at this. Not even the angels in heaven. It says in verse 13, verse 12, these things are things the angels desire to examine and to explore and to research and to know more about. Now, let me just suggest to you that we have got a better grasp and a better picture of the gospel and the work of Christ and we have got a better picture and grasp of the will of God because of suffering, because of what the refinement of our faith can do in suffering than even the prophets and the angels in heaven have. I want to point you to a little verse of scripture sometime. Look it up and read this and think about it. Matthew eleven eleven. Jesus says, of all those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. And then he closes with this little phrase, but he says, the least ones in the kingdom of heaven are greater than John the Baptist. Now, understand John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And even the smallest believers in the New Testament form of the kingdom know more and have better access and are closer to the heart of the gospel of God than even John the Baptist, who was a great, great, great man. My point simply this. Uh, the prophets were ministering to us. The angels desiring to know what we know about God and about his will and about his purpose. And we can know it when our faith is refined by times just such as the coronavirus pandemic. That's the first benefit. Now, there's another one. It's a very beautiful benefit, I think. You find it in verse 8 as it is explained and it is laid out to us. Listen to verse 8 as I read it again. Whom, speaking of Jesus Christ, having not seen you love, 
And though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Do you hear these words? Here's the thing. Refined Christian faith. Faith that has been made rich by times of distress and suffering. This kind of refined faith creates in us an unexplainable capacity to love and trust Jesus Christ. We don't even have to see him to love him. It says, whom having not seen, you love. Whom you do not yet see, you trust and you believe. And then out of this loving and trusting comes a mighty, mighty impulse of joy inexpressible. You can't even put it into words. It feels so good. It is a, a joy, an internal rejoicing that is unexplainable. It's, it, it, it is beyond. It is a peace that passes all understanding in this world. People of refined faith enjoy Jesus Christ in ways that others don't get there yet. Did you hear what he said? Joy inexpressible. Can't even find words. And it is not a, it is, this refined faith does not require that you be able to see the product. That you be able to see the experience, to experience the miracles. Miracle, miracles are wonderful. But you may tell you a secret. You know what Jesus told Thomas? He said, Thomas, you have seen and you believe but let me tell you something, Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and they believe. There's a blessing, a closeness, an enjoyment of Jesus Christ that you don't even have to have the visual, the experiential dimension that those of refined faith, faith that has been refined in the fires of distress and times of suffering, that such people can enjoy. That's a great benefit. That is a great benefit. And then there's a third one here I want to point out to you. You, you find it in verse 4. We're kind of working backwards through the passage. But there is this thing that is called an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And get this, verse 3. This inheritance generates what we know as a living hope. Do you see that in verse 3? He's begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection. This living hope is an inheritance that does not fade away, that is reserved, that is kept in heaven for us. While we then, as it says in verse 5, are being kept by the power of God here on earth until such day comes as our salvation will be full and total and complete in Christ. Now, that's a great benefit. Living hope, that's here and now. Inheritance in the heavens when Jesus comes again, that's then and there. But the then and there generates the here and now living, living hope. Living hope is, is a great thing. I want to tell you, I, I saw a small version of it, a picture of it, when I was a prison chaplain. You'd have these guys, and they'd been in seven years, they'd been in 10 years, some of them 12 years, and all of a sudden, there would be a quickness in their step and a, a, a quickness to respond and a yes, sir, whenever you spoke to them and a, a smile on their face. You know what was happening? Everybody knew what was happening. The prisoners, or the inmates, as we call them, were getting short. It was becoming close to the day when they would get out. Their hope for getting out had become not just some far, far off thing, but a living hope because it was going to happen in just a few days and in just a few weeks. And the closer it got to them, the happier they got. A living hope. Hope does this to you and me. It makes us happier people. It makes us easier to get along with. It makes us quicker to respond to the needs of other people. A living hope 
is one of the great, great benefits of a refined faith. Faith that has not been refined will never, never, never know the joy and the power, the power for life of the living hope that God generates in his people. People with this living hope are life changers and they're also world changers. Let me close with just this one little story. The story is told by, uh, I ran across it, uh, told by President Ronnie Reagan. In 1984, at the National Prayer Breakfast, President Reagan told the story, which was a testimony of a of a priest, a, a, a Roman Catholic priest, in the early early years, and back in the years, the late 300s, early 400s. His name was Telemachus. He was born somewhere in eastern Rome, or in the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, we don't know the date he was born, but we know the date he died, January 1, 404. He had traveled to Rome to celebrate some of the great moments in the life of the history of the church. Upon entering Rome, he found himself propelled by a mighty throng of people shouting and pushing, all wanting to go to the great Colosseum where gladiators that afternoon was scheduled to do battle in a savage fight to the death. When the fight started, amid deafening cries from the crowds wanting to see blood flow, Telemachus was stunned beyond words. He had never seen such human debauchery, and he had never seen human lust for blood. He had never seen human beings crying out to be able to see somebody cut to pieces and die. Not being able to stand the sight of two men cutting each other with swords, he descended into the arena himself, ran up to the fighters and demanded that in the name of Christ they stop right then and right there. They tried to ignore him, but he persisted, shouting, in the name of Christ, stop. At first, the crowd cheered. They thought he was a part of the act. Then they realized he was serious. And so they rained down on him all manner of curses and verbal abuse. Finally, one of the gladiators took his sword and ran him through and dropped him to the ground, mortally wounded. With his dying breath, he repeated over and over again until he finally could breathe no more in the name of Christ. Stop. The crowd suddenly became strangely silent as he died. They began to disperse in silence, not saying a word, one by one by one by one. There were thousands in that crowd. Do you realize this was the last time a gladiatorial combat ever occurred in the Colosseum in the history of Rome. After that day, not another single one. You know what happened? The Holy Spirit of God used the life of a little Roman priest who believed the gospel, who was moved and motivated by that wonderful living hope who loved Jesus, and he loved the life Jesus came to give us with a joy inexpressible, and he couldn't stand to see life snuffed out. And the sheer force of his refined faith, one man brought one of the great monstrous evils of the ancient world to an end. The idea of gladiatorial savage fight to the death. That's the way it is with refined faith in the lives of common, ordinary people like Telemachus. God does stuff with it. You know what he says to those of great faith? Be it unto you according to your desire. We could do well to remind ourselves of what James said and what Peter's saying all throughout the book of 1 Peter. 
Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into various trials and temptations. You can have your faith refined if you'll be faithful and don't quit. And then you can live above the fray, which is what Peter was trying to lift us to in this passage of Scripture. Bow with me in prayer, please. Gracious Lord, we pray that you would bless this reading of your word, cause it to become a lamp into our, 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 our feet, a light to our path, hide his truth in our heart. Refine our faith by means of the hardships that we go through in these difficult days. Cause us to become people of great faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.